traveled east, over the mountains and into the vast deserts of broken lands. As the days passed, my companion told me of himself, that he had once been a great warrior, and that a dark and secret burden now weighed heavily upon him. We traveled for an eternity across that barren wasteland. How long? I couldn't say. And always, a dark cloud seemed to follow us just over the horizon. Finally, the journey ended. We climbed the last bridge. There below us lay our destination. The shining jewel root lane with a great sea beyond. We made camp that last night. Perhaps it was the warm desert wind or the sound of the ocean, but for the first time in many weeks, I slept. However, the dreams return, but these were clearly not my own. I beheld the vision of a great man, the mage, Talrasha. You were there too, Tyrael. I remember seeing you in my dream. His brethren had cornered a great demon, Baal, the Lord of Destruction, who had been set loose upon the world. They attempted to imprison the demon within a sacred stone. Yet when their attempts failed, Talrasha selflessly volunteered to contain the demon within himself, completing the prison. He instructed his brethren to bind him within a tomb, buried under the sand, there to wrestle with the demon for all eternity. Seek Marius. This is my brother. Sleep now. We set out with the dawn. The next morning, we walked over the hill toward Lutgulain. I had no idea then of the horrors that were in store for me there. We arrive a few days later in Lutgo Lane via caravan, taking in the port city oft called the Jewel of the Desert, and it certainly lives up to its reputation. As the main trading port in Aranok, it's a surprisingly large city, including well-built structures and reportedly a well-trained army to boot. Yet as we pass the citizens wearing bursts of colourful clothing, they seem cheerless with tight-lipped expressions, belying a certain air of angst or perhaps dread in the wake of Diablo. Wasting no time, we speak to the young ruler Jeren, who greets us as we enter the town, saying, Good day. Greetings, honoured traveller. I am Jeren, Lord of Lutgolain, and I bid you welcome to my fair port city. I am glad to know that once again, caravans are free to travel through the Western Pass. For some time now, we have been under siege by an evil power that I cannot identify. Strange, it all began when a dark wanderer came this way, looking for the tomb of Talrasha. No one knows exactly where Talrasha, Keeper of Baal, is entombed, but it is certain to be far out in the desert. Now my people whisper tales of the dead rising from their tombs, and horrible creatures lurking amongst the moonlit dunes. Even I have witnessed things which I cannot explain. I've ordered the port closed and all trade ships moored until I am sure that my city is safe. Atma, the tavern keeper, has an important mission for you. Go see her immediately. You'll find her on the other side of town. Now I must return to the palace. I apologize, but I can't invite you in. Things are rather a mess right now. 
with no doubt in our mind now that Diablo has similarly disrupted the lives of the townsfolk of Lutgalane as he displaced the rogues out of their sacred monastery, we seek out the town healer Adma in need of help, who says, I don't expect this of you, but if you want to help me, I would be grateful. In the sewers below our city, there lurks a horrid creature that hungers for human flesh. The creature has killed many, including my son and my husband. If you destroy it, I will reward you. Please, be careful, though. That beast has taken enough from us already. The sewer entrance is through the trapdoor, just up the street. We cannot help but mourn the loss of Atma's husband and son and can only imagine the horrors of living in a city where a flesh-eating beast lurks underfoot, hungering for human flesh. The creature makes its lair in the tunnels beneath the city. He butchered my husband and son. I simply cannot bear to talk about it. Before we brave the depraved sewer lair, we first seek wisdom from our traveling companion, Decked Kane, the scholar, who says, The Herodrum used to mummify their highest mages and infuse them with spells that would allow them to protect their tombs, even after death. I have no idea why one of them would be acting so malevolently. Perhaps Drognan or Farah would know more about this. What a cursed thought. Cain's own kin, the Herodrum's best spellcasters, were gifted the ability to protect themselves in the afterlife. Clearly, we are but scratching the surface. Turning to our new ally, Drognan, whom Cain pointed us to for further guidance, who is also a researcher of everything Herodrum, he states, I've heard that you are responsible for banishing Undariel back to the Burning Hells. I'm impressed, stranger. That couldn't have been easy. My name is Drognan, and I know what you're up against, my friend. You ought to look over my inventory of items for trade. Farah and I have been talking about the creature recently. From my studies, I have deduced that it is Rodiment the Fallen, an ancient Herodric mummy that has for some reason left his tomb to prey on mortals. I'm doing some more research now. If you check back later, I may have some more insight as to his nature. Great. I can't imagine Cain coming back as a flesh-eating mummy, yet I suppose neither could the townsfolk of Tristram guess the macabre future of their own blacksmith. As Drognan has asked us to return later, we continue asking around town and stop by ex-bandit lord Elzix, who shares. Mm, you look like a sturdy adventurer. You know, I used to be quite the scoundrel in my day. I led the fiercest group of bandits who ever terrorized these sands. Nowadays, I run this here inn and pretty much stay out of trouble. <laughs> My days of adventuring are behind me. I hear that the creature kills his victims in order to hack off their limbs. I guess that makes me a less likely candidate, eh? <laughs> well, we had heard Elzix is missing an eye, some of his hand and half of his left foot due to repeated assassination attempts, so I guess there's some worth in keeping his spirits about him. We then turn to see Farah, the ex-paladin and blacksmith, about more practical instructions. Welcome, brother paladin. I am Farah. I was once a devout champion of Zakarum. I believe that the creature you refer to is one of the ancient Horadric mummies from the tombs that lie buried beneath the desert sands. It is unusual for one of his kind to be so far away from his resting place. I sense in this entity a restless and malevolent spirit. Ah, so Radamid's tomb is of the desert, and he has been sent to raise hell from underfoot. But the question is, who sent him? We then see a leery drunkard slash ex-warrior looking rather woozy named Geglash eyeing us off. We go to talk to him and he says, I don't know why you people keep pestering me. Graze seems to have this place locked down nice and tight. Not that I couldn't have done the same. I've proven my valor in combat plenty of times. Hey, don't touch my drink or I'll bore a hole into your skull with my thumb. We take his threat into consideration and also ruminate on the idea that if Radamant bit that thumb off, we wouldn't be losing much sleep over it. 
We then see the reportedly grumpy alchemist Lysander with a strange look of contemplation on his face. We ask him about Radamant, to which he states, How do I know I can trust you, hmm? You may be as shifty as that pack rat Elzix who runs the inn. But if you need a potion, though, I suppose I can make you one. For a price, of course. <laughs> I hear that beast is after body parts. Does he eat them? Ooh, ghastly. I guess it's natural to be morbidly curious until a mummy takes a big, wet bite out of you. As someone who has access to the docks, we then go to speak to the sailor, Mashif. Greetings. I'm Mashif, captain of this ship here. I make port runs around the Twin Seas and occasionally out to Kingsport in Westmarch. I haven't sailed anywhere lately, though. Jaren has ordered me to stay docked here in case of emergency. There are two entrances to the sewers, I believe. One of them is right near here, down by the water beneath the docks. I can see it from my ship, and you can bet I keep an eye on it every night. Thankful for an extra set of ever-watchful eyes on the mummy's makeshift lair, we speak to our old friend, Warif, before finally plunging into the stinky depths of the sewer, to which he states, I've heard tales of walking corpses out in the desert at night, though I've never actually seen one. And he's lucky. I'm sure the undead in the rogue encampment was more than enough excitement. With that, we have our supplies in hand and make sure we are armed with more than a poultry pig sticker as we hesitantly open the sewers entrance to this gruesome ghoul's abode. Entering the sewers, we're met with a particularly pungent smell. Thankfully, the walls are lit by torches, so we are at least somewhat aided by the light in this dank pit. It's not long before we're set upon by a pack of hostile, burning dead. Their champions move forth to rush us and are strategically girt by archers who, like their namesake, wield fire-infused arrows for greater effects. And it's immediately apparent they are in a league above anything that we've dealt with previously. Peppered by incoming projectiles, we're forced to back up and take out the melee cast comrades before engaging the archers. Delving further into the sewer system, we encounter a new enemy variant, the Sand Raider. Boasting big, elongated bodies, these humanoids are rumored to have made a pact with an unknown darker power to be adorned with four arms and the strength to carry a sword in each. Dealing with the swaths of these new enemies, we realize quickly there will be nothing dignified about this fight, as in the stead of chests we find we're forced to plunge our hands into goo piles for trinkets such as rings, rustle around in skull piles of presumably fallen citizens for loot, and unceremoniously kick rats out of their nests for rewards. After venturing down into level 2 of the maze, we spy a handy waypoint back to town, and decided best to take a much needed break from the stench and seek out the guidance of the townsfolk once more. To which Atma then regretfully states, I am starting to have second thoughts about my request. I couldn't bear the thought of you losing your life on my behalf. Please be careful. Deckard Kane too has further insight into the dangers ahead. The Herodric mummies were created to protect the tombs, but Rodiment is far from his burial chamber. Given the aberrations that have been witnessed lately, it comes as no surprise that even the ancient guardian spells have begun to unravel. Be wary of this as you venture farther into the desert. Drognan's research has also brought further disturbing clues. I've just been reading something interesting about this sort of undead. Apparently, certain Herodric funereal priests altered the bodies of their dead mages with magical and surgical techniques, often replacing body parts with those of animals. This was thought to augment their powers and raise their status in the afterlife. Elzix then points. If you're going to fight that thing, use some common sense. Be knowledgeable about what harms the undead. Poison, for instance, will have little effect. Noted, he's basically swimming in poison down there. Farah then shares. Drognan told me something interesting earlier today. It might explain why Rodiment is so restless, and it might have something to do with why he is stealing human body parts. Geglash then offers us a drink, saying, Aha! Back for a small shot of courage? Believe me, it doesn't help for long. <laughs> Drinks, barkeep! 
Grays then tells us why they haven't confronted versus contained Radiman. We've been meaning to send an organized group down there to kill that thing, but it would be dangerous. We just can't afford the chance of losing any men with all the trouble that's going on in the desert. Lysander, proving his hearing may be shot, mishears. Uh, peppermint? Oh, radiment. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, a foul creature. Some of my exploding potions should do quite nicely against him. <laughs> they usually work well against the undead. Mashif then muses. I noticed a rotting human arm floating in the harbor this morning. I suspected foul play, so I told Grays. He didn't seem too concerned since there haven't been any folk reported missing lately. And Warif imparts some of his classic wisdom. Death is not afraid of the living, but the living abhor death. Knowing poison is not our friend and that exploding potions may do the trick, we head down to the sewer's depths once more to face Radiment in his wretched lair. We continue our search for his lair and happen upon a gruesome scene. It appears as if his victims have been bound naked to long chains, but what they were forced to endure remains unknown. They are surrounded by what appears to be a pit of blood with some broken crates by them, and some of the town's guards look like they have unsuccessfully attempted a rescue. The longer we wait, the more the gore will grow. Stealing our resolve once more, we continue our search through this labyrinth for the creature responsible. Further in the sewers on the third and final level, we sense we might be getting close to Radiment when we start to see horrors, these black skeletons that deal lightning damage, in addition to the burning dead and burning dead archers, the crimson skeletons that also deal fire damage, and also a swath of other mages. It's then the quest notification button pops up, instructing us to kill Radiment. Radiment seems to have been busy in not putting any of his victims to waste, as he is surrounded by a horde of skeletal servants. Although we may want to dispose of his minions first in order to prevent Radiment from reviving them, we live again. Without as many of his minions to help him, we then face Radiment, a huge mummy emitting foul black magic with a skull for a face in a headdress. Burning down this patchwork frame as he, with great zeal, as quickly as our strength permits, he makes sure to try to sap said strength first with a particularly nasty poison, and an ever-growing army of the undead as he raises nearby corpses with ease, a boon of his knowledge of the dark arts in life as it is in death. Drenched in his foul poison breath attack, we have anticipated this somewhat, and thanks to carrying a few spare potions from our encounter with Andariel, we are somewhat buffed from the full brunt of his attacks. When we finally fell Radiment, bolts of holy energy start shooting down from his body, which will also finish off any remaining undead fiends in the vicinity. Radamit then drops a unique tome. The tome is named Book of Skill, and it grants us an extra skill point. Although repeatedly killing Radamit after this quest has been completed does not yield more Books of Skill, unfortunately. As well as a few blue items, we notice a notably stronger set of chainmail, which has nearly doubled the defense qualities of our current armor. We then pilfer the contents of the glowing chest found in his lair, which holds the Herodric Scroll, which will activate the next quest, the Herodric Staff. As we gather our loot and put the disgusting sewers behind us, we get one last glimpse of Radamit's handiwork, with a bench adorned with bodies and tools as he hacked his victims to for heaven knows what purpose. Upon arrival in town, Deckard Kane identifying our wares then instructs. If you haven't already, tell Atma that Rodament is dead. It may help to ease the weight of her mourning. We understand this is a weight lifted, yet still may impart little comfort. Before we speak to Atma, we source a potion for our wounds and something for the smell from the alchemist Lysander. Ah, little of what I am able to hear is of any value. But Radaman's death, <laughs> however, is news worth hearing. I'm sure Atma will be glad to hear of this. And we agree. His ears may not be what they used to, however, this is for Atma's ears. Wasting no time further, we speak to her and she says, they say that the taste of vengeance is bittersweet, but I find it to my liking. In addition to my undying gratitude, I have spoken on your behalf with the rest of the townspeople. 
the merchants have agreed to show their gratitude by offering their wares and services at lower rates. Oh, Jaren wants to see you too. You'll find him in front of the palace. Although Artemis thanks her more than enough reward, it is the utmost kindness that the merchants are now providing wares at a discount. Heading over to Drognan to see his newly discounted stock, he says, From what you tell me, it would seem that Rodamant was bent on the task of reviving his own mummified corpse with the flesh of the living. This is very unusual indeed. It takes an incredible magic power to alter the singular purpose of an undead mind. Perhaps there is a power at work here, which is beyond my ken. I don't know what's worse, the thought of him eating victims or the fact that somehow imbibing flesh would help him revive himself into a darker form. This is truly an evil power orchestrating something unnerving for the peoples of their port town. We then speak to Alzix, who says, We ran into one of those old tomb guardians when I ran with my bandits. I know they aren't easy foes to face, so you sure have my respect. Have you told Atma yet? I guess with his missing limbs, Elzix's bandit running days are over. Farah then confirms, As you have helped Atma and all of us, so shall I help you. If there's anyone who can aid us, it's an ex-paladin armorer. Speaking to Geglash, looking rather wobbly once more, he wooses. Whoa, whoa. Radamant the Fallen, is it? I've fallen off many a bar stool, and no one calls me Geglash the Fallen. They might go so far as to say, Geglash, <laughs> you've fallen. <laughs> Geglash the Fallen. I like it. We pause to ponder on the thought of him falling off his bar stool, and collecting ourselves, we head over to Grace, who says, Greetings. You've killed Rodamond, eh? That's quite a nice piece of work. If you ever need a job as a mercenary, I'd be happy to sign you up. With a slight nod and thanks for the offer, we then finally speak to Warif once more. Atma's been telling everyone what you've done for her. It seems true. No good deed goes unrewarded. Unfortunately, in Diablo, even if you're a servant of the light, or more specifically, the Herodrum, your reward may not be the townsfolk accolades, but instead wearing a skin coat as you're rewarded with a restless undeath by in a sinister prime evil. The shrines in the desert are leftover artifacts from the Great Sin War that ravaged these lands almost a thousand years ago. They still function, but most travelers believe them only to be remnants of the distant past. After felling Radamant and completing his quest, we can locate a strange Herodric scroll in his lair. Upon returning to Loot Go Lane, Deckard Kane will approach us with somewhat welcome news. Ah, the lost Herodric scroll. What a fortunate turn of events. As the last living Herodrim, I alone have knowledge of its meaning. Now, to read the Herodric runes it bears. Hmm. The Herodric mages, after binding Bale within Talrasha, magically sealed off his burial chamber from the mortal realm. Those same mages also crafted fearsome Herodric staves and imbued them with the special power to open the chamber's hidden door. After nearly losing one to the thievery of a rogue sorcerer, they divided all the Herodric staves into two parts, wooden shaft and metal headpiece, hiding them separately to safeguard them. The Herodrum foresaw our current plight and designed the hiding places to reveal themselves to worthy heroes like you. Collect both parts of a Herodric staff and unite them using a Herodric cube. Then you may enter Tal Rasha's burial chamber. So, we are to find and battle the deadly greater evil Bale, bound to Tal Rasha, of whom we saw visions of in the beginning of Act 2. It seems the Herodrum, due to attempts of theft, have wisely hidden their powerful staves and dismantled them so that errant thieves and wizards can't enter Bale's tomb. As such, uniquely, this quest is broken into three separate parts and our quest update saying, search the halls of the dead under the dry hills for the Herodrum Roderick Cube, the Maggot Lair under the Far Oasis for the Shaft, and the Claw Viper Temple for the Headpiece, as we need all three items to complete this staff and face whatever lies in Tal Rush's tomb. 
As we head through town, we realize the town folk, also unique to this quest, do not have any additional dialogue to add throughout this entire endeavor. However, I think it's prudent we should speak to Grays for much needed aid of our companion. Brognan's a mystery to me. Then again, I never did trust mages much. As we step foot out of the relative safety of Loot Lane, now that we've felled Radiment, and into the searing heat of the arid, unending desert known as the Rocky Wastes, we are met by an array of vicious new demons, the Dark Wanderer no doubt left in his wake. We are immediately overwhelmed by a pack of deadly and massive beetles who have a chance to burst forth erratic waves of lightning upon striking them. With little resistance to said lightning, this can be deadly. The once passive huntresses, foul cat-like humanoids bearing whips and malicious intent, and also vultures frenzied at the idea of wet succulent meat to strip off the bone in the dry desert heat. The desert itself is unforgiving, and there are signs that those who have strayed from Lutzko Lane were made into a quick meal for the denizens of the sadist sandy oasis. It's not just townsfolk skeletal corpses that litter the desert sands either. Huge skeletons of large creatures appear, perhaps the original fauna of this area, stripped to bleached bone and left to rot in the sun. As we enter the dry hills, which we are informed the Herodric Cube is rumored to lie under the halls of the dead somewhere within, we see more travelers executed for trying to travel outside the city, and it's quickly apparent that no one is traveling east without paying the ultimate price. We're then bound upon by a new enemy, Cave Leapers, who dance over our heads in a trio, attacking in tandem. After haphazardly hacking at the hopping haters, we find a usual place of respite, an actual oasis even though its water is murky and seems to be soured. It's not long before we realize night has fallen around us and we're more exposed than ever before. Finally, we sight in the distance the one area that is well lit, the entrance to the Halls of the Dead. However, entering the halls, we immediately smell decay and the stench of death permeates around us, which is exactly what we encounter. Moving a few feet to our right, we see undead called Decay who release plumes of noxious gas as they are casually redeaded. Their bat-like companions, the Desert Wings, excitedly drop from their perches on the ceilings to show us just how electrifying their shocking spurs on the wings truly are. After battling our way through a further two levels of death, decay and destruction, we see a golden chest on level 3. However, it is too precious to be left unguarded, and as such, it is in the stead of the voracious, super unique Saber Cat Blood Witch the Wild. After we felt the super strong Blood Witch and a gaggle of cat groupies with surprising ease, and somewhat disappointedly search her corpse, only to find a paltry two wrist blades, which are blue, and we can neither use or sell for much. However, we then examine the golden chest, which holds holds the quest item, the Herodric Cube, boon of a box in hand. We then hurriedly teleport back to town and speak with Deckard Kane. You have quite a treasure there in that Herodric Cube. According to Herodric lore, the cube can restore a Herodric staff. To do it, use the cube as you would a scroll. When the cube opens, place both pieces of the staff into it and use the cube's transmute power. You'll be pleased to know that the cube has other alchemical uses as well. Six gems plus one sword transmute into a socketed longsword. You may also transmute two quivers of crossbow bolts into one quiver of arrows, while two quivers of arrows yield one quiver of bolts. I must leave it to you to discover other formulae. Ah, the fabled Herodric Cube. Kane tells us the purpose of said cube, uh, quite drawn out, I might add, as well as other information about its uses. The most important of which is the fact that now we can use the cube to transmute items into better items and many of our stashed gems to boot. However, there's no time to rest on our laurels and celebrate just yet. Taking advantage of the new day, we begin our search for the Maggot Lair, under the far oasis, for which Kane and the townsfolk give no further dialogue. 
Here, we again cautiously venture into the desert once more, and it's not long before we're set upon by a new enemy aptly titled the Itchies. It seems the advent of Diablo's passing has invited a plague on the land of biblical proportion. Shortly thereafter, while treading the blistering sands, we spy a strange and ugly orifice in the ground. The entrance is to that of the Maggot Lair, and looks like a tunnel dug into sand doomed by, well, if it's maggots, then one can only imagine the bloated torso it'd take to wriggle inside. Once entered, we find ourselves in a near pitch black cavern, and we can barely make out a fallen town's guard drenched in a gelatinous goo. Definitely all smell. As we brave the depths of the claustrophobic hole in the ground, we run into the biggest, foul, and unholy maggots one could witness. After hacking them to sludge and their girthy brethren as they attempt to birth their own putrid protective posse, we further encounter scores of insect-like creatures such as sand maggots, scarab demons, and swarm insects. Making our way through the circular tunnels until we reach level 3, at the bottom of the maggot lair lies the super unique sand maggot matriarch cold worm the burrower this boss has the ability to spawn full grown sand maggot monsters and stands taller than any maggot we've seen before so we are forced to lure out a newly birthed allies before piercing the gruesome maggot's flesh until it spews forth a volcano of disease and corruption it's a poison which fells our fellow companion page and has us thirstily gulping potions just to stay standing. After we manage to defeat the matriarch, we search the room and find a rather lacking breastplate, a two-handed axe, and sacred globe, none of which are helping us. However, we then greedily pilfer the contents of the golden chest in the southwest side of the room. In it, we find some gold and the Staff of Kings, the shaft portion of the Herodric Staff. Heading back to town, nightfall and once again, we address Cain once more and tell him of our new boon. The Staff of Kings! You astound me, my friend. You have discovered the shaft portion of a Herodric staff. I trust you know how to use a Herodric cube to unite the shaft with its headpiece. And so there is one final piece left, the headpiece of the staff, located in the Lost City. The sun has grown disgusted with the terrible deeds it must shine upon each day. Damnation is upon us all. While searching for the headpiece to complete the Herodric Staff, upon entering the Lost City, located off the far oasis, a sudden eclipse darkens the sky, and the quest notification button pops up, telling us to speak to Drognan in town about the mysterious darkness. This triggers the Tainted Sun quest, and both quests conveniently have the same destination, the Claw Viper Temple. Heading back to Lutko Lane for clues of this mysterious eclipse, we seek out Drognan, who says, I've been researching this lengthy eclipse, and I believe it to be the work of claw vipers. Find their temple beneath the desert sands, and you may find the source of this curse. What a powerful piece of sorcery for the serpentine demons. We realize to overcome this curse, we should seek the aid of the townsfolk, however, many of which point us back to Drognan, of whom we've already spoken. My astrologers failed to predict this eclipse. You should seek Drognan's advice. Drognan the wizard will have some idea as to what is happening. Drognan may have some advice on this matter. Hmm. I think I'll speak with him myself. This unnatural nightfall is no doubt caused by evil sorcery. Drognan might know what we are dealing with. However, the remainder of the villagers have more insight into the matter. Squinting to see, we bump our way around town, starting with Elzix, the ex-bandit lord turned innkeeper, who says, Two men arrived late last night bearing a story about evil magic. They said they saw a gathering of giant snake creatures performing some arcane ritual. They sound like the serpent men of the desert. Who are these mysterious men? 
Surely the Wanderer and his companion, Marius, wouldn't stand idle in town to tell of an impending attack orchestrated by the three. Or is it men whispering of dark arts born of the occult? We should, perhaps, investigate further. We then seek out the rum-soaked Geglash, who muses. This whole place is one big ale fog. I don't know if Geglash is being serious, but hey, at least it'll appear more alluring to the ladies in the dimly lit tavern. We then seek out the hired muscle, Grays, to get more grounded news of what this has done to the morale of his militia. This midday darkness reeks of foul magic. My men and I are trying to keep the peace, but this kind of thing really scares people. If the flesh-eating ratament wasn't enough to shake the townsfolk to the very core, everything has got to be scarier in the dark, and the people must be petrified. We then see the potion-brewing Lysander, who curses. Claw vipers. This outer darkness mirrors the inner blackness of their souls. It is they who have eclipsed the sun, I'll wager. <laughs> they are a venomous band. Venom seems to be the least of our worries. How do you fight what you cannot see? Speaking next to the sailor Mashif by his ship, he states, This permanent darkness is very unsettling. Hmm. It would make navigation by stars easier for me, though. Perhaps he is right. We've been abandoned by the light of heaven, but it's our duty as a holy paladin in the absence of light to carve out the darkness by force if oh. necessary. Back in the ruins of the lost city, we're forced to contend with hordes of what appear to be ex-residents reawakened from their slumber. Perhaps at home, in the cold, dark nothingness, the allure to come above ground calls to them, and so we hack through a pile of wretched, rotten, risen. After dealing with a pack of undead, marauders and their kin, we find the Valley of Snakes adjacent to the Lost City, guarded by a plethora of fire towers that are brutally efficient at flinging flames and other nefarious defenses of the ancient city. It's then we stumble upon the entrance of the Claw Viper Temple and steal our resolve as we enter, saying, Light guide my way in this accursed place. The temple itself is overrun with undead. Skeleton warriors girded with their now all too familiar guardians and the embalmed that have nasty, noxious gas they release upon re-death. Making our way to the second level and quite leery of the lack of abundant vipers, we seek the wisdom of the townsfolk once more, greeted by Atma, who is clearly addled by the time-twisting taint. I was going to go to bed, but then I realize that I have no idea what time it is. It could be the crack of dawn for all I know. Geglash then ponders. It's strange when the morning after the night before is still the same night. Kane helpfully informs. The source of this spell is probably a magical altar. It will not be enough to kill the claw vipers. To reverse the spell, you must destroy the altar. Farah then horrifically reveals, The Claw Vipers practice evil magic. They have also been known to kidnap travelers and sacrifice them to their dark gods. I wonder which gods they serve outside of the evil three. Lysander then points us in a new direction. Yeah, I don't know much about the habits of Claw Vipers, to be honest. Drognan will probably know something about the nature of the magic at work. Mashif then admits he's grown less fond of the stars, even if they would aid with his travels. I've had about enough of this darkness. I don't even know what day it is anymore. Wariv waxes lyrical. The calculated coldness of the reptilian brain makes the claw vipers uncanny adversaries. Jaren tells us what we already know. This eclipse is a definite manifestation of evil. Elzix humorously muses. I usually charge for rooms by the night, <laughs> but I may have to soon change that. Drognan then confirms Kane's theory of the Viper's true power. I've discovered a reference to a similar eclipse several hundred years ago. It says that some desert-dwelling snake demons had erected an evil altar which caused the sun to go black. Perhaps we're dealing with something similar here. Look for an altar in the Claw Viper Temple. And before we head off, 
Grays assures us. But don't worry. My men and I have an iron grip on this town. If those cursed claw vipers are plotting anything against us, we'll be prepared for them. It's good to know we aren't going to have the town terrorized for a second occupation of Lusko Lane by treacherous demons. And with our companion page fallen, we enlist Grace's help of a warrior, Wahid, for a much needed second sword arm in the tomb. With our sights set firmly on finding an altar in the Claw Viper Temple, we portal back once more into the depths of the dark and dank dungeon. As we enter level 2, we see a big, strange, dusty pit in the middle of the room, girt by pillars, which we cannot make out quite what the contents are. Here we will find more claw vipers and a super unique monster called Fangskin. Defeating Fangskin and his kin, we pick up a powerful yellow falchion called Impsaur boasting elemental and added damage, plus a piece of blue mail, and exploring the tomb further, we see what appears to be viper deities on the walls adorned with human skulls. In the southwest side of the room is a cage full of human bodies from God only knows where. As then we head up the sandy stairs in the middle of the room and see an altar which is covered in blood and looks to be a site of unholy rituals. Upon breaking the altar, flashes of light release, as if trapped in this ghoulish seat of worship. And as the light finally floods back the darkness and it abates, we state, The light can never be extinguished by evil. Not only does this complete the Tainted Sun quest, but in the altar we see it also yields the coveted Viper Amulet, the missing headpiece of the Herodric Staff. As we head back to town, the headpiece in hand, light shines anew on the Desert Jewel, and we are warmly greeted by Atma, who says, You have done well to restore light to our world. Geglash saunters over and slurs. So this is daylight. Hmm. It's overrated. <laughs> Looks like no more beer goggles for the rest of the town, hey, geggy old boy. We then spy Kane, who beckons to us, saying, The viper amulet you bear is actually the headpiece of a Herodric staff. Yes, you have an uncanny knack for finding rare and valuable artifacts. Of course, you'll have to use a Herodric cube to combine the headpiece with the shaft. Farah then calls to us and says, and we agree. Drogman seems to have taken you into his confidence. This is good, for you will benefit from his wisdom. Drogman's wisdom of the Herodrum, and as is Cain's, is invaluable, especially of this area. Lysander then queries. Oh, claw vipers are fond of magical artifacts. <laughs> Did you happen to find one in their temple? A wry mention of the staff headpiece, perhaps, or of the booty. Speaking of which, down at the docks, Mashif, too, has booty on his brain. So, did you plunder any booty? How quickly do they forget the sun was literally blotted out and their minds are firmly fixated on things that shine in the light? It's then we seek out the caravan at Warif to tell him of the good news. With renewed daylight, one may gather the wits that were scattered about like restrictive undergarments in the darkness. I feel like Warive is channeling Geed there, but no need to chafe. We then proceed to the palace where Jaren beckons us over as we had been instructed by Kane and says, The sun again shines on Loot Lane. I'm beginning to like you, traveler. At least one person is wholly grateful for the feat we'd have accomplished. Although perhaps I spoke prematurely about Elzix, who has a certain gleam in his single peeper as he pronounces. Ah, it takes but one eye to revel in the beauty of our restored sun. I'm glad he too appreciates the effort put forth. Heading back to the original quest giver, we see Drognan, who congratulates us. You did well in destroying the Claw Vipers. We are all glad to see the sun return to its former glory. Glory. Wearing full plate and packing steel in this heat, I can conjure a few other words for it. Unfastening a few notches on said armor to let in a nice, gentle breeze, we finally make one last stop with the mercenary Grace before we head out again, who says, I'm glad that's over with. You and me both, Grace. You and me both. However, although victory for the light and staff pieces is complete, I believe this, unfortunately, is just the beginning of the town's woes.
I've been researching the old records, trying to find the location of Tal Rasha's tomb. Though I haven't found the tomb itself, I may have a good lead for you. The great Vigerai summoner, Horazon, built his arcane sanctuary somewhere around here. He was a powerful spellcaster and kept demons as slaves within the sanctuary. He kept a close eye on great events too, such as the imprisonment of Baal within Tal Rasha's tomb. If you could find Horazon's sanctuary, I'm sure that it would hold some clue as to the tomb's location. Though I doubt Horazon is still alive, you must proceed with caution. There's no telling what could be waiting inside. When I spoke of this with Lord Jaren, he asked that I send you to him. Perhaps he knows of a secret entrance or the like. After collecting the pieces of the Herodric staff and heading back to Lutgo Lane, we are instructed by Drognan to seek out the young ruler Jaren at his palace who shares. When the troubles began here, I allowed the terrified harem guilds to join me within the safety of the palace. All was fine until one night. Screams echoed up the stairwells from the harem. My guards arrived to find the poor girls being slaughtered by a merciless band of hell-spawned demons. My brave guardsmen tried to push the demons back into the mysterious rift from which they came. Ever since, my men have fought a losing battle. Demons have continued to pour through the rift into the palace. Ultimately, I hired Greys and his mercenaries to help protect the rest of my fair city. Drognan believes that the arcane sanctuary lies buried underneath this palace, since Lutkalane occupies the site of an ancient Vigerai fortress. My palace is open to you now. Take care. Our darkest fears have come to light. Of course, Horizon's Vigerai summoning site was at the heart of the palace, and the townsfolk and harem girls have paid dearly for his actions. Also of note is, Horizon's Sanctum originally appeared as a cut quest during Diablo 1, and we were forced to face Horizon himself. <laughs> However, as with most cut content from Diablo 1, Diablo 2 has a much different take on the story and is just as dark, if not darker than the original. Before we head into the palace for clues on the whereabouts of Horizon's prized journal, which is our best lead for hunting down Bale's tomb, we decide to speak to the townsfolk scattered around and see if they have any further clues of Horizon and his rumoured arcane sanctuary. We first seek out the wisdom of healer Atma, who questions. Arcane sanctuary? That place sounds awful. Even if you find a way into it, what makes you think you'll be able to leave again? She's right. Crossing into an arcane plane seems dangerous at best. We can't even begin to fathom what we're dealing with. With that grim assessment to mull over, we spy Gaglash, the drunken lout in the tavern, beckoning to us. Look, look, I'm just about as tough and arrogant as they come. Uh, but you never catch me trying to tame a demon for a pet. That's just asking for a lot of trouble. Arrogant? Yes, tough, undecided, but respect for having marginally more sense than Horizon himself. We then head back to the center of town and seek out the wisdom of the Herodric scholar, Deckard Cain, once more. I very much doubt that Horizon still lives in his sanctuary. He possessed great power and influence over demons, but even that may not have been enough in the end. One of his notoriety cannot easily remove himself from the vengeful reach of hell. Although it gives us some manner of comfort to think that Horizon is no longer in his sanctuary, this is potentially even more troubling news. Whether alive or deceased, this Horizon could not be filching the ranks of any of the evils for long unnoticed. Hammering away just over yonder is Fire the Blacksmith, who declares, Ah, the ancient mage Horizon. He believed that he could bend evil forces to his will. What he didn't know was that evil uses man, not the reverse. The Vigerai still revere him as a symbol of man's ability to triumph over otherworldly forces. The Church of Light, however, cites him as an example of man's folly. While the mages revere this man's mystical prowess, the Church of Light and those with common sense, it seems, know that you cannot bend evil to your will without a cost. Or as Nietzsche once said, he who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. And if you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss 
also gazes into you. With that terrible thought, we see the potion brewer Lysander next, who also has his own philosophy on summoning. Horazard vowed it necessary to lock himself up for all time, just to protect himself from those angry demons. Such is the fate of one who practices the summoning arts. In that or eternal damnation, uh, there's old summoners and bold summoners, but no old bold summoners. So, should we expect to see Horizon locked up? I also enjoy the rhyme of the old and the bold. I bet there are no bold and beautiful summoners, after a demon escapes anyway. We then see the ship captain Mashif down by the docks, and hopefully if he's got word of this sanctum in his travels. Ah, the legend of Horizon is an old one, especially around these parts. You wouldn't believe the feats and strange events that are attributed to him. One can only imagine. Also, that none of them are good. We then seek out caravaner Wariv, who says, A careful caravan gives wide berth to sleeping bandits. If Horizon is gone, let him remain so. He has said everything we need to know and as eloquent as any have put it. Passing the palace quickly, we then speak to Elzix, who shares, an arcane sanctuary under the palace? <laughs> I'd heard that there were some underground cellar levels that Jaren used as chambers for his treasure and such, but no arcane sanctuary. Of course, an ex-bandit leader knows a rumor of treasure. Who would have thought? Maybe my caravan should have given him a wider berth. We then talk to the man who presumably has had the most contact with Jaren of late, the mercenary leader in charge of keeping this town safe, Grays, who says... <laughs> The only thing in Jared's cellar are the harem girls that have been hiding there since the troubles began. Hmm. Has Grays been in this cellar? Is Jaren's concern real or is he hiding something? With all of these clues about Horizon and his wicked past and what to expect if we encounter this treacherous sanctuary, we have naught to do but greet the palace guards and head into the palace. Welcome to the palace. With the thought of what we may encounter of those poor harem girls, we ready ourselves as we head down the winding steps and into the palace's first floor of the harem. We enter the first level of the harem and are met with a disturbing silence. Colourful walls decorated show no sign of struggle, although cups knocked over and dishevelled look of the floor could mean somebody left in a hurry. An errant bat glides aimlessly around the room and we question how long it's been since the women have stepped foot here, and how many would tolerate the presence of a bat and few rats scurrying about for that matter. And where are their guards? We then head into the northern room to see it empty and in the same state. Quickly checking the room to the south, it's clear the floor is totally void of life. Bar a few rodents and small creatures, but we must delve deeper to uncover the mystery of the missing girls. Heading to the second floor, we're met with darkness that is unsettling. There's a guard unceremoniously skewered hanging limp and lifeless in front of us. The decor, although darkened, is similar, but splashed with lashings of blood, making a mockery of the formerly pristine white dancing statue's grace and beauty. It's then we're happened upon by a gaggle of horror archers and their mage brethren. They appear to have helms similar to the dress of the guardsmen, and make us wonder if they too had been turned to the unholy service of the three. After fighting through vicious waves of their kin, we find some of the harem girls. Bound against a pillar, blood pouring from their slit throat, we don't know how long they've been dead, or what untold nightmares they were forced to endure. But we know that unfortunately, this is likely not going to be an isolated occurrence. After slogging our way through two levels of the harem, we find a dead guardsman shackled to a door, accompanied by a deceased harem girl, as if wards to further unwanted trespasses and an entrance into the palace cellar. The cellar itself adorned with various barrels and yet still painted with smatterings of blood like the previous floors. On the ground is a body of a harem girl left where she lie and, and then we're pounced upon by an angry pack of dune beasts, hacking our way through the beasts with waves of skeletal mages lobbing various spells of lightning, 
poison and isodus, and the previous gore becoming more pronounced with every step, guardsmen now being decapitated in a mockery by the demonic inhabitants of the cellar. It's on the third floor of the cellar that we happen upon some sand raided demons and a super unique monster named Fire Eye, who drops an enhanced level skull cap upon defeating him and grants us access to another room with a portal in the middle. This must be the fabled portal to Horizon Sanctuary. However, before we delve into the unknown horrors of Horizon's portal, we decide it prudent to stay a spell in town to resupply and return to the villagers for further guidance, to which Atma says, So you've been in the palace, have you? Tell me, why does Jaren keep that place locked up so tight? Gaglash then imparts supreme wisdom on fight or flight tactics. All my years of brawling, of pummeling both the unsuspecting and the deserving have yielded two insights. You can either fight or you can run. All other strategies are variations of these. Cain then reveals what, what we unfortunately already know to be true. I've been thinking about the problems in Jaren's palace. Perhaps this has occurred to you as well. If those cellar passageways lead to the arcane sanctuary, then that is where the demons came from. Horizon's haven must have been breached. Farer than warns. Even a sanctuary such as Horizon's can be breached by the tentacles of evil. Such a haven could have become a chamber of unspeakable horrors. Be wary of what you may unleash. Lysander, miss his. The horizon is always out of reach, you should know that. Oh, a horizon. Oh, I see. Uh, yes, well, he was insane. Yeah, brilliant, yes, but uh, yeah, total lunatic. Yes, Lysander, lunatic. Mischief by the docks impatiently requests. So, now that you're such a pal of Jaren, why don't you ask him if I can set sail one of these days? I'm running out of patience. Worive then burns a new visual into our brain. Fate is like a caged gorilla. It will pelt you with dung if you mock it. Elzix then muses. I understand that you've been talking to Jaren. Well, if so, then you're the first in a long while. Since the trouble began, actually. Do us a favor and try to find out what's got Jaren so edgy all the time. Okay? Grays somewhat questions our integrity. What's got you so occupied in the palace? Oh, don't tell me you're finding the harems more compelling than killing demons. <laughs> that would be out of character for one such as yourself. Confirming he is fully unaware of the horror that lies in that accursed place, and why Jaren chooses to loiter on the safety of his palace steps. I am certain that you will find the information you need when you find Horizon's journal. I suggest you find it quickly, for Diablo may be getting closer to freeing his brother as we speak. And then Jaren warns us of the rogue mage. There was an eastern mage, a Vigerai, I believe, who visited me almost a year ago. He was very interested in the history of this site, and he seemed particularly fascinated with the palace architecture. I gave him a tour. When he found the ancient seals over a passageway in the cellar, he became very agitated he asked for some time alone to study them, and I granted it. Shortly after, he left with no further word, and I never saw him again. Odd, don't you think? It's not completely unheard of for those trained in the dark arts to find the allure of power absolutely irresistible. But what did the wandering wizard discover? And why did he leave? Or did he delve into the accursed portal himself? There is only one way to find out, as we ourselves tepidly step through the portal in the palace and through to the arcane sanctuary. This surely is the product of a twisted mind. Upon entering our journal updates, telling us to find Horizon's journal, we see we're in a huge, almost infinite expanse that seems to be separate from time and space itself. The air, if such a thing seems to exist here, is thrumming with magical currents. And although we're not well versed in mysticism, we can tell the architecture itself has been warped by magics and the starry void is some kind of current in which it flows. It feels less of a prison and more of the construct of a warped yet brilliant mind. 
fighting our way through the maze of narrow paths and red portals. There are untold waves of goatmen, wraiths, and vampires waiting in ambush. The small corridors thankfully grant us the ability to fight them in packs, although the fire spells from the vampires can be nasty. The arcane sanctuary itself consists of four arms with a waypoint at the center. At the end of the three arms, we typically find just a golden chest filled with treasures and a dead end. However, as we travel to one of the arms, we begin to become cursed and pelted with strong magical attacks, and the quest notification will pop up that we have entered the summoner quest. This means that we are close to Horizon's journal. We race up the stairs as we defel the summoner himself as quickly as humanly possible, as he is ferociously powerful glass cannon that we've ever met, dropping him within a few blows as his mocking laughter echoes through the void. Rest in peace, tortured soul. He then drops a few paltry blue swords and nothing really of note. However, we then see on the pedestal his famed journal, to which it says, Seekers of the tomb of Tal Rasha will find it through the portal, but know that the glowing glyphs recorded here in my arcane sanctuary are the signs of the six false tombs. The missing seventh sign marks the tomb of Tal Rasha. Of the Herodrum, he might be called the foremost. It was a shining but brief moment for the mage clans when they set aside their differences and worked together against the common enemy. The Herodrum relentlessly pursued the three across the desolate empires of the east and even into the uncharted lands of the west leaving the Archangel Tyriel's hands unblemished. Presuming the three to be vanquished, the Herodrum's unstable fellowship began to dissipate. Abandoning their sacred charge to safeguard the three soul stones, the disparate mage clans began to squabble amongst each other over petty differences. Their conflicts not only dissolved their brotherhood, but strengthen the evils which they had buried beneath the cold earth. And then a special red portal opens to the Canyon of the Magi, and our quest log will now display the symbol of the true tomb of Tal Rasha. Before we head to the canyon, we heed the journal's warning and speak once again to the townsfolk. Returning to town, some of the people will give us news of the summoner and his history, as well as talk about the sanctuary, uniquely giving some NPCs two different responses when greeting us. Seeing Atma first, she says, You're more the hero than I could have dreamed. Perhaps there is hope for us after all. I haven't forgotten those poor girls and glad the Radamit incident is over and the townsfolk never witnessed the horrors within their walls. Geglash then jokes. I wish Jaren would have let me in the palace. I would have saved those girls and kicked demon ass back to the fire pits of hell. Luke's. I don't know. They may have willingly jumped in the pits of hell rather than Geg's sweaty rum soaked sheets. Kane then shares. You must move quickly now, friend, for Diablo is undoubtedly close to finding what he seeks. Find the tomb of Tal Rasha before he frees the Lord of Destruction. I hope that this false summoner found peace in death. Unfortunately, it is more likely that he will be dragged down into hell by the demons he was bound to. Let this be a lesson to you. Demonic magic is a quick path but its powers are seductive and deadly. And he is right. We must make haste if we're to catch Diablo before he frees his destructive kin. Tragically, although not implicitly stated, it is official in canon the summoner's identity was that of Jazrath of the Vigeri, the wizard from Diablo 1, making all three heroes from the original Diablo accounted for and have been corrupted and tragically twisted by the prime evils by the events of Diablo 2. Farah then affirms, I feel no pity for that would-be summoner. His terrible ambition for demonic power was his undoing. You merely hastened the inevitable. Faith is stronger than any armor. The shield will protect the body, but faith will strengthen the courageous heart. As a fellow ex-holy paladin, her words ring true. However, Lysander, cocking one okay. ear, fails to hear us for a third time sputtering. Ah, uh, such is always the fate of those who meddle with evil. Horazan's urinal? 
Oh, journal. Oh, yes, well, uh, glad you found it. Uh, such a shame about those poor harem girls, huh? Yeah, I shall miss them deeply. I mean, their conversations, of course. Don't worry, Lysander. You'll see them soon enough. We then visit Mashif by the docks, who says... Well, you've got what you're after. Now get a move on before it's too late. So, now we know Jaren's little secret. Well, I guess I can see why he wanted me to stay, though. I'm just glad it didn't come to that. Now he tells me to wait some more, in case you need to get out of here. Well, for you, I'll do it. Maybe they'll mention me in the epic ballads, eh? I hope there is little cause for a ballad and this ends quickly. Warive shows further concern, saying, I guess you'll be heading to the tombs now. I hear that they're in the deepest desert regions. Well, the news going around town is very unsettling. Apparently, we were in more danger than anyone thought. Good work, friend. You may have saved all our skins. We appreciate his thanks, but fear the true danger lies in one of the seven tombs. We then pass Jaren, who says, The demonic force that was emanating from the corrupted sanctuary has dissipated. I thank you greatly for your help. Now we can look to rebuilding our lives. All will be for nothing, though, if you do not stop the greater evil which is rapidly gaining ground. I thank you for your heroic aid. I'm also glad that you found something you were looking for. The journal should help you find the true tomb of Talrasha. Hopefully there is still time to get there before Diablo. Go now, and good luck. Journal in hand, we have but a few more people to see before we search in the desert heat once more. Elzix then says, You make me long for the days of glory, when I had both hands, both eyes, and more of a foot. News of the tragedy in the palace is spreading fast. How awful. And the thing, this whole time, I thought Jaren and his guards were in there playing with the harem girls. It seems a simple curiosity added with time and mixed in fear sparks many a rumor. So, Horizon's been dead for some time. I take it you at least found what you were looking for. Unbelievable. The harem girls are dead? The palace guards been fighting off demons from the cellar? <laughs> How could that happen without my knowledge? It's like my father always says, never assume. It makes an ass out of you and me. And finally, we seek Drognan once more, who muses. Larger forces are moving inexorably towards us. You must now make haste to the tombs. You have found Horizon's journal. Excellent. But I must caution you. The mark of the true tomb of Talrasha is sought, if not already known, by Diablo. I needn't elaborate on the implications of that. No, we understand the dire effect Diablo's unleashing of a second greater evil has on the land. With that, we make haste once more to find the tomb of Tal Rasha and stop Diablo before it's too late. It is well known that there are seven great Horadric tombs hidden beneath the sands in the furthest reaches of the desert. One of them surely must be Talrasha's prison. You must explore each of the tombs to find Talrasha's exact location. Of course, Diablo is searching for the tomb as well. No one can guess as to what terrors he has unleashed in his search. The Seven Tombs quest can only be complete after first finding the hidden pieces of the Herodric Staff and reading Horizon's journal, in which a glyph of the true tomb of Baal, Lord of Destruction, will be recorded in our quest log. However, originally it was the young ruler, Jaren, as a mark of trust, who initiated the Seven Tombs quest some time earlier, saying, I have heard of your many deeds of skill and bravery. I feel I can trust you with something I have been hesitant to speak of. Drognan and I have concluded that the Dark Wanderer who passed through here recently was Diablo himself. Drognan believes that Diablo is searching the desert for the secret tomb where the great Horadric mage, Talrasha, keeps Baal imprisoned. You must find Diablo and put an end to the terrible evil that has fallen upon our city. Drognin is wise and is sure to have some helpful advice for you as to how Talrasha's tomb may be found. It may take you quite some time to find the tomb. May you be ready when you do. We then seek out the townsfolk of Lutgo Lane for further guidance before confronting Diablo himself and perhaps his brother, Bale. 
if we're too late. First, we head to the healer, Atma, who shares. I've heard legends of the tomb of Tal Rasha, but I thought they were just old tales meant to scare young children. Deckard Cain once said the same thing of the Herodric tales of Diablo back in Tristram. It is in our nature to not want to believe such an evil exists, and the nightmares it might bring to light if set free. We then spy Geglash, the drunken lout, who bravely states, Oh, I'd go with you to those tombs, but um, uh, I don't like all that living dead stuff. It's as if Geglash needs a reminder, nobody likes that living dead stuff. Well, maybe necromancers. We then seek the wisdom of the scholar Deckard Cain once more about the evils loosed on Sanctuary. Diablo nears his goal. We have little time to lose. Remember, my friend, that Andariel gave herself willingly to Diablo's cause. It would be prudent to assume that the other evils will attempt to aid their master as well. They say that the lesser and greater evils are oft marred by infighting. Whatever plans they have must be dire for them to hold more than a tenuous partnership. A few steps away, we then speak to the blacksmith Farah, who recalls, Legend has it that Tal Rasha lies imprisoned within his tomb, forever struggling to keep the Lord of Destruction bound. His was a selfless act, although perhaps foolhardy. It's sad that, although brave, no man can seemingly hold the will of evil of that magnitude, at least not forever. Then the hard of hearing Spellbrewer Lysander points. When Tal Rasha chose to embody the spirit of Veil, he knew his doom was to wrestle eternally against the will of the greater evil. Look around you and ask yourself, has the battle been won or lost? If he had seen the inside of the palace, I think he'd say this place is little more than Bale's bathroom. Mashif, the shipmaster, then admits. I'm sorry, I can't help you much here. Now if the tombs were across the ocean, then I'd be the guy to talk to. It must be hard being curtailed from the freedom of the ocean, and Mashif is a good man for not setting sail by the night sky. We then next visit another traveler, Wariv, the caravan master, around the corner, who also has chosen to stick around, saying, Be very careful, my friend. I think I've seen enough recently not to doubt that these tombs exist, and if they do, they are most certainly guarded by terrible creatures. Warif, foregoing his usual quips for more pragmatic advice, belies his true concern. We then seek out the ex-bandit leader Elzix once more to see if he had spied the tombs in his travels. So, you're going to search for the seven tombs, huh? Don't you know that they're just desert legends, passed between merchants and travelers? No one really believes that they exist. The merchants either know better or nobody is fool enough to travel that deep into the dangerous desert wastes. Stealing ourselves, we then choose to speak to Graze, the mercenary leader, for his own type of martial wisdom once more. If you're going into the deep desert, why not hire a few of my men to watch your back? Honestly, it's a good thing we have had Wahid by our side. His polearm has gotten us out of a pinch more than a few times. Finally, we then speak to the Horodric scholar, Drognan, who says, The Horodrim were a powerful order, although maybe too prideful. Tal Rasha was one of their order, and that should tell you something. Any man who believes himself strong enough to contain one of the prime evils is in for a rude awakening, I should think. With the staff pieces in hand and the Herodric cube, we make haste, heading back to the arcane sanctuary where we step through the ominous red portal to the Canyon of the Magi. As we arrive into the canyon, we find ourselves a welcome waypoint. Darkness has fallen and we step into the great expanse. We then make our way west and are immediately pounced upon by swarms of hellcats and giant beetles illuminating the night sky with pulses of lightning licking the sand every which way. After fumbling forward a bit further, we noticed a tomb's marking. Checking our journal, we realize that this is surely one of the seven false tombs and it's not long before we come across the next. 
And although we know the promise of loot in these false tombs is no doubt plentiful, as some are probably harboring a few errant gold chests, our quest has to stay true as we blindly search through the valley for the true tomb of Baal. Hours feel like days as we pass various fallen statues and have the shocking revelation that metal armor is a phenomenal conductor of electricity. It's then, finally, we find a forgotten nook of the canyon and the symbol which matches that of Talrash's tomb and tepidly step inside. Once inside the dark and dusty tomb, the air grows thick and bears all the hallmarks of death and decay, and yet a low, sinister energy echoes throughout. Unpleasant energies aside, we move through the tomb to meet more beetles, and enemies such as unravelers, burning dead, and ghoul lords, and super unique monsters. Whoever designed this tomb, one thing is clear that they made it into a sprawling maze, not wanting its contents easily found. After much searching and slogging through waves of enemies, we finally happen into a room that seems different to the others, as it has an orifice in the center and all the false and true symbols of the tombs pointing to a hole in which would no doubt hold the Staff of Kings. However, we're nearly dropped where we stand by an unraveler's dark waves of putrid energy attacks after we approach the Staff Holder in which light pours from and, and realize now is the time to reforge the Staff of Kings and complete the quest. After reforging the staff, we place it delicately into its holder. Then light brilliantly crackles up from the staff base, and the seven symbols shoot forth beams of light as the staff blasts a surge of energy into the wall, unveiling what appears to be a secret entrance to the once sealed Tarash's tomb. We waste no time as we rush into the tomb to face what we can assume are the evils within. It's then bursting out of the darkness, Duriel, the lesser evil, and Lord of Pain, Moxus. Absolutely stunned, we somewhat panic in the dark, stepping back to collect ourselves. These precious seconds lost, however, we pay for dearly, as Wahid is felled in a matter of moments. Juriel, with its giant, fetid, bloated, maggot body, sinister face, and swinging, gore-covered mantis blades, promises only one end. A painful one. Stealing our resolve, we down potions thirstily as we begin to absorb Juriel's namesake of pain in unending waves. Juriel then deploys cold attacks to freeze our limbs so we cannot stave off his vicious, bloody, sweeping, fleshy sides. We fumble through potion after potion of thawing and health, shakily alternating between the two and hoping the might of our zeal will strike true between being pummeled by this foe. The finally landing the killing blow, Juriel erupts in a sick heap of guts and putrid entrails as maggots scuttle from his bloated corpse, making us wonder if these are Juriel's foul babies or carrion he naturally nurtures in his belly, but it's sickening, the undescribable smell. We see that on his body he dropped yellow light gauntlets, ring, amulet, helm, and a nef rune, a tidy hall he hid in his nest, and our quest updates telling us to explore Talrush's tomb. Before we step inside, we see what appears to be a man, horizontal, bound by all four limbs in a mural on the wall. It seems to show Talrasha being bound and the soul stone of legend being inserted into his willing body to wrestle with the spirit of Baal for eternity. And although Duriel informed us we're too late, we hope against hopes that this was another trick of the evils and prepare ourselves for what is inside nonetheless. The walkways of the tomb are infested with an unidentified oh. carrion. We make our way into a large main room that has a bridge over a pit of lava and a binding stone in the middle. No doubt where Talrasha was bound and an angelic being with great glowing wings in his stead and greets us saying, I thank you for my freedom. For my freedom. But I did expect you earlier. I am the Archangel Tyrion. I came here to prevent Diablo from freeing his brother, Baal. But I have failed. 
Now, terror and destruction roam free throughout your world. Even now, they head towards the eastern capital of Kurast, to the very heart of the Zakarun Temple. There, they hope to find their eldest brother, Mephisto, the Lord of Hatred, who was imprisoned there ages ago. If the three prime evils unite, they will be invincible. Though it is unclear as to what their aims are, it is certain that they must be stopped at all costs. I am broken, and the energies that tie me to this world are diminishing rapidly. You must take up this quest and prevent the three brothers from reuniting. You must cross the sea and search for Diablo and Bale in Kurast. Now, hurry, mortal. Time is running out for all of us. Before we give Diablo and his brother Chase to Karast, we speak to, perhaps for the last time, the townsfolk of Luke Golane, starting with Adma, who says, You have proven to be the greatest of heroes, and I am honored to call you friend. Thank you for bringing peace to our lives again. We are grateful too to be considered friends to one such as her and mourn the tragic loss of her husband and son, an ever cruel reminder of the blight that has swept the land. We then see Geglash, mug in hand and looking like he has something to say as usual, and he does. You're an inspiration and such a hero that it makes me look twice as bad. <laughs> ah, you're okay. Hey, just save some glory for us little guys, huh? I didn't know my quote-unquote glory was stopping Geglash from putting his jug down and picking up a sword. Maybe next time the greater evils cross the land, Geg old boy. Hopefully not. Done with idle banter and wishing Geg goodbye, we see Deckard Cain once more, who informs us. The Archangel Tyriel was the one who gave the soul stones to the Herodrum 260 years ago. It is highly unusual for the forces of heaven to so directly interfere with man's destiny. But Tyriel was said to act of his own volition. We have never been able to discern why. Perhaps he goes against the consensus of heaven because he doubts our ability to defend ourselves. Or perhaps he sees more threat than his peers. Where the actions of hell often seem straightforwardly bent on destruction, the motives of heaven are unfathomable. Now make haste. Both Diablo and Bale must be stopped before they join with their brother Mephisto. If the three prime evils unite once again, the world as we know it will be no more. We do not know Tyriel's intent. However, we do know the fervent desire of the three, and perhaps that is enough for now. Turning next to Farah, she says. This is terrible news. Bale is in possession of one of mankind's most powerful mages, and the Lord of Terror guides his path. They must be stopped, for I am sure they mean to free their elder brother Mephisto, the Lord of Hatred, who lies imprisoned under the corrupted city of Kurast. I fear you are walking into a great evil, but your faith can save you. May you walk in the light always. I too mourn the loss of Tal Rasha and am more stalwart than ever to honor his memory. They call them great evils, but I'm yet to see anything great about them. Lysander, amazingly overhearing us, then beckons us over to say, I'm sorry things didn't turn out as you had hoped. Go and remember us fondly. You know, you bothered me far less than most. Thank you. I think... Elzix then informs us. I heard that Diablo has managed to best you, at least for the time being. I hope you catch up with him soon and send him back to hell for good. I personally would prefer to wipe them from existence, but hell will have to suffice. We speak next to Grays, once more loitering near the sewer entrance. I've heard that your foe got away from you this time. Well, look at it this way. You've got the demons on the run. If you're going to be leaving, then, well, thanks for your help. Positive and a welcomed thanks. Many thanks to you and your mercenaries for guarding the city. We then see the Herodric scholar Drognan for further insight into the events that transpired. It is most unfortunate that Tal Rasha has been consumed by Bale's destructive influence. There are many secrets known to the Herodrim which could be used by Bale against us. 
you must travel east by sea to Kurast and stop Diablo and Bale before they free their eldest brother, Mephisto. Oh, the lands of the Eastern Empire are not the same as they used to be. There's been little word for some time. Speed is of the essence. Go quickly, my friend. May the fates smile on you. Mephisto? Three prime evils in one place? Our stomach churns and tightens as we realize that this unholy reunion is more dangerous than we could ever imagine. We then seek out Warif next by his caravan, who says, Never fear, my friend. You did the best you could. I suspect that Diablo and Bale are now heading east towards Korost. You will find them. I know you will. I too have a feeling that I will find them. But beyond that, only time will tell. With the people accounted for and spoken to, I head to Jaren once more. You have done very well. Few could have come this far, let alone discover the true tomb of Talrasha. Unfortunately, I hear that Diablo and Bale have eluded your grasp. This is most unfortunate. If you wish to travel east, I have authorized Mashif to give you passage by sea. I imagine he should be very anxious to leave by now. Good luck on your quest, and thank you again for saving my beloved city. You will always be welcome in Lut Golain, my friend. With no time to waste, we give Jaren our thanks, taking his palace in for the last time and hoping that Lut Golain becomes the jewel of the desert once more. With no time to waste, we race to the docks heading east after the two brothers, hoping to stop them in their tracks as we'd hate to think how powerful they would become if they became three and then we see Mashiv to head east. Always, it seems, against the setting sun to the east. Jaren tells me I should take you east to Kurast. I haven't been there for several years, but rumor has it things are pretty grim. My companion drew in the dank, cold air of the tomb. It seemed to strengthen him. I stood in the doorway between light and dark. What was left of my sanity implored me not to enter. But that voice was just a whisper now. As we worked our way down deeper and deeper into the crypt, I began to see a change in my companion. He seemed to be gaining strength. I could hardly see in the gloom, but my companion seemed to know the way. We came at last to a great hall. It was then I realized my companion hadn't been gaining strength. He had been losing what was left of his humanity. He moved with demonic speed and then you appeared. Stop! The beast contained herein shall not be set free, not even by you. Release me. Release me. Help me. 
help me. just ensured the doom of this world. You cannot even begin to imagine what you've set in motion this day. Go to the Temple of Light in the eastern city of Karast. There you will find the gate to hell opened before you. You must find the courage to step through that gate, Marius. Take the stone you hold to the Hellforge, where it will be destroyed. Now run. Take the stone and run! What choice did I have? I ran.